Welcome to the Cocky Ride Home for Monday, December 13th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, need a creative boost? Try this napping hack from Thomas Edison and Salvador Dali. Research from this month says it actually works. Plus, the woman who successfully traded a bobby pin for a house and Swedish towns are trying to reclaim their names from IKEA products. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Thomas Edison was one of those people who didn't seem to require as much sleep as most of us, or at least claimed not to. Like my hyperactive 70-year-old AP US history teacher, Edison insisted he only needed four hours of sleep a night to function. However, he did take naps. And I don't include that detail to say, well, actually, he did sleep for more than four hours. In fact, his naps weren't very long at all. That's because as soon as he started really falling asleep, he would wake himself up again, and he did this by going to sleep holding a ball in each hand, one of which would hopefully fall on the floor when he became unconscious and the noise and vibrations of them falling would rouse him. And when he woke up, he claimed that he could remember all of those great creative thoughts that sometimes occur to us right before we fall asleep. And he's not the only one who was a fan of this trick. Whether he heard about it from Edison or somewhere else, Salvador Dali was also known to fall asleep holding, in his case, a key that would drop onto a metal plate to wake him up so he could tap into the most creative corner of his mind. And there's been talk over the years that Albert Einstein and even Alexander the Great also employed similar versions of this technique. Now, sleep hacks abound throughout history and certainly in clickbait articles around the web these days, but a new study published this month in the journal Science Advances shows there might actually be some credence to this method. Quoting Scientific American, The study reports that we have a brief period of creativity and insight in the semi-lucid state that occurs just as we begin to drift into sleep, a sleep phase called N1, or Non-Rapid Eye Movement Sleep Stage 1. The findings imply that if we can harness that liminal haze between sleep and wakefulness, known as a hypnagogic state, we might recall our bright ideas more easily. End quote. To test the hypothesis, study lead Delphine Udiette and her team at the Paris Brain Institute recruited 103 participants who reported being able to fall asleep easily and gave them a series of math problems that were united by a hidden rule. This rule would help them solve all of the problems more quickly. Participants who figured it out right away were dismissed, and the others were set up in recliners for a 20-minute break to relax. They were also given objects to hold in their right hands. If the object fell out of their hand, they were told to report what they had been thinking of just before. They were also undergoing polysomnography to verify if they were awake or in N1 or N2 phases of sleep, N2 being the next deeper phase of sleep after N1. Quoting again, Following the break, the study subjects were presented with the math problems again. Those who had dozed into N1 were nearly three times as likely to crack the hidden rule as others who had stayed awake throughout the experiment, and nearly six times as likely as the people who had slipped into N2. This eureka moment, as the authors call it, did not occur immediately. Rather, it happened after many subsequent attempts to solve the math problem, which is consistent with previous research on insight and sleep. End quote. Some of that previous research includes a 2018 study which found that a brief period of quiet resting helped participants solve the very same math problem used in this new study. And that 2018 study and this one might not necessarily show how restful periods or N1 sleep can help people tap into their creativity, but rather, UC Santa Barbara psychologist Jonathan Schooler, who was not involved in either study, told Scientific American, quote, residing in the sweet zone might have also simply refreshed the study participants, making it easier for them to solve the problem later. End quote. But he does say results from the recent study indicate that that sweet zone may help people access otherwise lost material in their brain. And while, according to the study, waking up right as you hit that zone does seem to have some kind of effect, how you can train yourself to get there had less consistent results. Participants were given small drinking glasses instead of balls like Thomas Edison used because those were found to be ineffective. And 63 participants did drop the glasses, but only 26 did after getting to N1 sleep. So you may need to come up with your own method for waking yourself up at just the right time, but as Adam Harhorowitz of the MIT Media Lab, 
who was also not involved in the study, said to Scientific American, One of the great things about this study is, quote, You can go ahead and try it home yourself. Grab a metal object, lie down, focus hard on a creative problem, and see what sort of eureka moments you can encounter. End quote. But if you are not someone who can drift off easily enough to test it out, you could also try going for a 10-minute jog. A study published last month in the journal Scientific Reports indicates that that's all it takes to get a boost in mood and cognitive function, just 10 minutes of moderate-intensity running. Which makes me feel way better about the very short runs that I've been going on lately. Quoting Science Alert, The study looked at the prefrontal cortex in particular, the part of the brain that is associated with executive functions and controlling mood. Running brought on increased blood flow in this area, the researchers discovered, and all that coordinated movement also gives the brain more to think about, it seems. End quote. The connection between physical activity and boosted mental well-being is not a new discovery, but the researchers here wanted to focus specifically on running, not activity broadly, because it's something that's been so important to the evolution evolution of human beings, and because it's been around for a relatively long time compared to other activities like biking, which has only existed for a handful of generations. And their findings, that increased blood flow to the prefrontal cortex and self-reported boosted moods of participants after running, as well as quicker responses to a color word test, might actually give us some insight further down the line into our species evolution, given that many functions of the prefrontal cortex in humans aren't found in any other animals' brains, according to Science Alert. But the best news is that it doesn't take a ton of exercise to get some benefits. 10 minutes of moderate running or an incomplete nap. Either one could leave you feeling refreshed and alert. And hey, one more Salvador Dali fun fact for you. Back in the 40s and 50s, he collaborated with Hallmark on a series of Christmas cards. It started with a set Hallmark was doing of great artists past and present, so his three designs were included among designs from Van Gogh, El Greco, and Grandma Moses. Dali's designs included in that set were of the three wise men, an angel, and Madonna and Child. But ten years later, he was asked to do his own series of designs for all the major holidays. These included at least one of Santa Claus with desk drawers like jutting out of his torso, all filled with Dali's iconic melting clocks. Only three of them were ever printed and put into circulation, because it turns out that Dali's avant-garde approach wasn't so popular with the greeting card crowd, but you can see a few examples at the Hallmark link in the show notes. So longtime listeners might remember back in May of 2020 when I mentioned a woman with a burgeoning TikTok following who was attempting to revive Kyle McDonald's 2005 red paperclip project by trading a bobby pin for a house. So McDonald's original experiment from 15 years ago started with a red paperclip, which he traded for a series of items, a fish pen, a hand-sculpted doorknob, a camp stove, and on and on until he traded a role in a Hollywood movie for an actual house in Saskatchewan. All one-to-one -one trades, no money involved, except things like you know travel and shipping and back then probably web hosting fees. The project, which he documented on his blog, got a lot of media attention when it was happening and led to a TED Talk, a book, and the usual slew of appearances and offers to McDonald. It was a really cool piece of early 2000s internet experimentation that has gone down as a bit of lore. Demi Skipper, a product lead at Cash App, heard about the Red Paperclip project and decided, towards the start of the pandemic, that she wanted to try it out herself, starting with a bobby pin instead of a paperclip. Now, when I first mentioned her on the show, she had just completed her fourth trade, a vacuum for a snowboard. She was still anonymous and just beginning to blow up from zero to a million followers on TikTok alone. And now, over a year later, she has finally done it. She traded an off-grid tiny home for a full-on house in Tennessee. Now, the way she got the tiny house, which really just a trailer decked out with a Tesla power wall and solar panels, is kind of unbelievable, and one of her many trains that caught a lot of flack. She had previously traded in three tractors for a Chipotle celebrity card. 
which apparently is a big deal. It's a thing Chipotle makes for actual celebrities when they display public affection for the chain. It's a custom card with the celebrity's name on it that gives them one free burrito a day for either a year or for life. Different celebrities have reported different amounts of time. They've also occasionally been given out to us plebs as part of contests, usually in partnership with an influencer. The Chipotle celebrity card that Skipper traded for was apparently worth $20,000. But like just about everything in her trading journey, the key was finding someone who both wanted it and had something they could trade of equivalent or greater value to help Skipper on her way to trading for a house. Throughout the project, she used Craigslist, eBay, Facebook Marketplace, and increasingly direct outreach and correspondence with her mounting followers to find the best trades. And that is how she ended up finding a self-professed biggest fan of Chipotle's who also had that rad tiny house she was willing to part with. From there, another follower reached out to Skipper, one who had been following from the beginning and waiting to make her move. This follower was a house flipper who owns about 15 different houses at any given time. She'd known all along that she wanted to try for the ultimate trade, but was waiting for something that would be a good trade. And the off-the-grid trailer slash tiny house was it. She got in touch, they made the trade, and Demi Skipper and her husband became the proud owners of a house just for the cost of a bobby pin. The house is on a decent plot of land with two bedrooms and one bathroom, and Skipper and her husband, who currently rent a place in San Francisco, are in the process of moving to Tennessee, where they'll renovate and live in the house. Now, I don't know if they had been trying to specifically look for places in Tennessee, or were just down to go where the wind took them, but what a great ending to the story. Skipper told The Guardian that it was a pretty tough journey overall, but quote, I think I've gotten much better at seeing the negative and flipping it into a positive. Had someone said that someone was going to trade something that's worth not even a single penny for a house that's worth millions of times more, I feel like people would say it's impossible. But this makes me feel like anything is possible now. End quote. And once she's settled into her new place, she's already looking to do the whole thing again. But this time, she says she'll donate the house to someone in need. Do you have an Ektorp sofa? Or an Ingatorp table? Maybe a Tofton waste bin? IKEA's product names are impressively well known, despite the fact that most of us English speakers can't pronounce them to save our lives. They are not, however, made up Swedish words. Most of the product names are taken from real places in Sweden lakes, forests, villages, castles. But you'd never know it, because if you try to Google any of them, the only results you get are for the IKEA products, not for the places themselves. And now, the Swedish Tourism Board is fighting back. In jest, for a marketing stunt. They produced a new video showing off stunning footage of places like Jarfjallet, a ski slope better known as a gaming chair, Kallax, a village in Lapland better known as a cube shelf, and Tofton, that artistic lakeside town better known as an IKEA trash can. The main highlight of the campaign has been Lake Bolaman, which in IKEA parlance refers to a toilet brush. Local officials even held a ceremony to install a new sign seen in the video that says, Welcome to Bolaman, more than an IKEA toilet brush. Quoting Fast Company, to Marcus Hogloff and Joanna Hoffman-Bong, who worked on the campaign, IKEA's dominance as a brand is a blessing and a curse. They both live minutes away from Ektorp, which is located in Stockholm County, but it occurred to them that even they think of sofas when they hear the word. Even in Sweden, these names are often more attached to products than places, Hogloff says. I can't imagine any Swede naming their child Billy because the name is now so associated with IKEA bookshelves. End quote. Although they do point out, piggybacking on IKEA's success is the only way they'd be getting such major coverage of these places anyways, so of course they are not genuinely upset. The tone of the campaign is very tongue-in-cheek. And in total, there are 21 places included in the Tourism Board's Discover the Originals campaign, so if you've got a trip to Sweden you're dreaming of or just want to cross-check the namesakes of all the IKEA furniture in your house, hit up the Visit Sweden link in the show notes. All right, well, that is it from me for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.